um, simple attack in which you have a whole bunch of uh, guys uh, producing outlandish estimates of the uh, of the measured quantity. So you can assume that your adversary has taken over a few sensors and uh, uh, make them produce a ridiculous value. And you have to aggregate the, the reading of sensors without knowing who might be compromised. So this is <coughs> what we do here. Simple attack would be this. Uh, you have here uh, how many uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 legitimate sensors and five sensors that are uh, uh, that are outliers and you can see here on this plot these are the measurements of the outliers so five sensors send readings of a hundred and the other send readings um, uh, just uh, with stochastic uh, errors. Uh, so let's see how well the system, the three algorithms perform. Uh, okay, sometimes mathematics are even reluctant to start. Uh, probably didn't have coffee this morning. <laughs> okay. <coughs> So it's getting there. Yeah, MATLAB would zip in, uh, in uh, a few milliseconds, but uh, uh, there is a way uh, to force Mathematica to speed up to avoid uh, the symbolic by putting N everywhere, but uh, then the code becomes uh, unreadable. So let's see how uh, the system performed. So maximum likelihood now is not calculated from all sensors, but we isolate only the uh, honest to God sensors, uh, right? So to get this error ML, you have to both know which sensors are broken or under attack and what, and for all other sensors, what their variances are. On the other hand, the, none of these three uh, algorithms knows uh, what uh, the, uh, the which sensors are broken. And you can see that uh, all three of them, uh, the reciprocal uh, and uh, UNSW1, uh, and to a lesser degree, affine produce a reasonable, well, actually the uh, the, the Kerchover one, the Affine, did a pretty bad job because it's uh, uh, it essentially took the mean. So all of them correctly isolated the outliers by simply during without any decision or without any thresholding, right? They simply assign negligible weight for to all outliers. Right, and uh, uh, the affine one uh, took simply the mean of the rest, but uh, the reciprocal and the UNSW one uh, remained extremely, extremely close. So they were essentially unperturbed by the attacking sensors that made these uh, uh, huge uh, errors. Right and uh, are still extremely close to the theoretical optimum. But one can say that's not the worst what can happen, right? Uh, so let me show you an attack that was designed by a student of mine, Moxen Rezvani. Um, uh, that uh, came up with an ingenious idea how to mess up the, yes? I think you can just, uh, this is the uh, true value, and then you can um, want the value that you want to skew, and uh, just vote randomly in between these, and these values will be appear to be legitimate votes. The, so the, the idea is, uh, uh, that's right, the, the, 
strategy of attack is if you have five attackers, four of them will produce outlandish values, and the fifth one will produce a mean of uh, number of uh, uh, remaining sensors times the, the tr tr uh, 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 estimate of the true value, right? Uh, and uh, the four attackers. Uh, so four of them skew the system, and the fifth one votes for the mean of the true plus the skewed ones, and he appears to be the closest to the truth, right? And so let's see how, how the system performs uh, in this uh, case. Uh, okay, so uh, let me just show you how it is. Uh, uh, just f let's look at the code. So you can see here uh, that uh, um, so you have f uh, four sensors will do the following. Uh, so the so TS will be uh, for honest sensors, so to speak. The measurement will be the actual temperature, and the uh, last will give t uh, temperature plus a large number M, as you can see here. Right, and then the fifth one uh, will find the mean of uh, all of the sensors, so uh, honest sensors and four attackers, and then uh, he will give the reading that is precisely equal to, the, uh, to that value, as you can see a little bit down here, let me see, where is that done? Yeah, here it is. Uh, no, it's not there, where do I do the... Let's see, am I showing you the right file? Where is the... Thank uh, you the... Ah, yes. So the 25th, uh, the NN, that's the last one, 25th sensor is simply the mean of both accurate sensors and the four outliers. And he should, appears to the system as the most accurate. Well, let's see what happens. Oh, come on, Mathematica, you see? Ah, it started now. Okay, let's see what it will produce. Okay. Okay, here are the results. Now look what happens. The one that was the best got completely messed up because he actually kind of thought of this fifth attacker as the most accurate one. Uh, and uh, we are about, and we got completely, almost completely unaffected by, uh, okay, so uh, then, as I mentioned, Ishrak produced a variant of this attack that apparently uh, deceives also our system, but I never got a, uh, time to look around what exactly he did, also because I want some of you to do that. Uh, so uh, look, I'll send you, uh, uh, it could be a very nice project uh, to understand uh, his attack and then see if you can fix the aggregation to become resilient also for that attack. And if you do that, uh, this can be a publishable paper, and you can uh, earn uh, eternal glory and uh, <laughs> recognition. And the university might keep you employed. <laughs> okay, so you can see here that uh, 
the reciprocal gave a full, uh, full uh, credit to the fifth attacker. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, notice it's really amazing. Uh, our system hugged the theoretical optimum almost perfectly. So, so, that, so the system is also robust against, against sophisticated uh, attacks. Uh, so, as I say, a good aggregation has to perform well <coughs> in the presence of stochastic errors, but should also perform well uh, when you have collusion attack, right? And uh, lo and behold, uh, that's uh, what I wanted to tell you about iterative filtering algorithms. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, so why this algorithm works uh, against this kind of attack intuitively? Intuitively, that's a very good point. Because you ask many, many sensors who is more likely. So even the guy that appears in the initial estimate to have almost no variance, uh, from the perspective of many honest users, his measurement will not be correct. So this only the assumption that the, the colluder is the minority. Yeah, okay. yeah. There is no, you know, uh, if the the colluders become majority, then like what it happens in a political system, right? <laughs> uh, then, uh, 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 then there is nothing that the the masses can do. So you just have to suffer the bad luck, right? And wait for next uh, financial cri crisis, but that's, uh, that requires several lectures. Oh, sorry, so. just uh, one more. So yes. if the, uh, um, it's not unbiased measure, for example, the Olympic referees prefer pre uh, this particular country, uh, would that Gaussian measure also a good estimate? Actually, measure? amazingly enough, uh, uh, Oxen did test it in the presence of biases, and it still works okay. Because the error is uh, square root of the sum of the square of biases and the variance, kind of. So it doesn't really distinguish it. Uh, it works well even with bias. And of course, it works well uh, even when the, even though the formula is kind of Gaussian, but it works well when the distribution of errors are governed by totally different uh, um, Totally different distribution. Yeah. But the problem is really interesting, you know, how to aggregate inconsistent data. What can this be? It can be market analysts, uh, it can be uh, consumer feedback, uh, right? So lots of things, and today, with this business with big data, kind of aggregating inconsistent data is a, and finding some reasonable estimate um, is uh, an extremely important problem. <laughs> yes? So with this code, did you come up with a bunch of variances and then see how closely they... Yes, in fact, uh, uh, we had probably, shall we say, at least 10, 15 different uh, versions of it. And if you look at the code, it actually gives two versions here. And uh, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, so that's actually a very good point. But when you try to design such algorithm, what guides you? You want to avoid singularities first, right? And then you want uh, kind of to delocalize information, right? So that, that because it makes it much uh, less likely that collusion can work, right? But then it's trial and error, a lot of it. I probably Moxen has tried uh, uh, a large number of uh, functions. And uh, I think these two appeared uh, to work the best, and I don't know which version Ishak managed to sabotage of the two, uh, but uh, if you want to play with this, I'll
uh, I'll send you the, his, uh, I think I have his Mathematica code, uh, and you can decipher, decipher what he's doing and try to protect the system against uh, that. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure, maybe his uh, attack requires that you know exact values uh, of uh, measurements of other sensors, uh, which of course in practice is not. The attackers uh, measure and then uh, find, uh, find the measured value, aggregate the measured value and assume that the rest of the sensors, the mean of the other sensors will, will be around that value. Um, but I, I think it's an interesting problem and practically uh, relevant problem. So um, it, it's a nice project for, for you. Any other questions? Okay, if no questions, then we start a new topic, which is recommender systems. Right? So let us um, let us so recommender systems are essentially based on the notion of iterative filtering. Uh, for example, if you log into Amazon and you buy a book, uh, the system recommends you uh, what you might be interested in or actually even on the basis of what you have already bought at Amazon, even before you buy anything, it recommends uh, uh, other books. How is this done? Well, of course, the system doesn't know what's the content of the books, right? It's not a semantic kind of algorithm, but it simply keeps a history and looks uh, uh, for people who bought the books that you did buy in the past, uh, what other books they also bought, uh, right? And this uh, uh, and proposes exactly this. And the same, the same is uh, when you misspell a word uh, in, uh, um, uh, in uh, Google search, it uh, gives you correct uh, spelling, right? It asks you, did you mean? And then gives you the correct spelling. And how, do it, uh, uh, how does it do that? Well, it's not looking in the dictionary to find a replacement at all. This would be too slow. It simply keeps track. Probably someone has already made uh, um, such a mistake uh, uh, before, and the system remembers it. So when you make, and then it looks how the person corrected, what was the next search and takes this as a correct spelling. Of course, when I make a mistake, then poor Google learns very poorly because the, my next attempt is also probably very likely <laughs> to be misspelled, just in a different way. But uh, uh, since uh, people with my level of English are a minority, uh, the hits that come uh, uh, are in, ma in majority, so the system actually gives a good recommendation. Okay, so let us see uh, just uh, how these systems work. Um, in fact, uh, there was a couple of years, maybe you heard about that, well, by now it's not a couple, it's probably more than 10 years, this Netflix uh, challenge, right? So Netflix gave uh, uh, announced that it will give one million dollars to whoever proposes the best recommender system that would beat, the, of course, the, their recommender system. And uh, lo and behold, uh, uh, the, and the competition was open for a whole year. 
right? And um, it uh, turned out that uh, the two top scoring systems uh, produced exactly the same accuracy, but one submitted the solution a uh, couple of minutes before the other, so it was providing the winner. Right? Now, what is amazing about that is the two different systems produced exactly the same error rate, which would kind of indicate uh, that you reach probably some form of information theoretic optimum of, um, uh, of, uh, of prediction. Now, the, the, uh, so sadly enough, uh, Netflix never implemented uh, in any of the great solutions because why did it? Uh, oh, maybe nowadays it's neural networks. <laughs> They're so irritating. Um, <laughs> you know, it's so irritating when something works much better than the rest, uh, and you have no clue why it works well. Uh, it's absolutely, you know, when people did the uh, hidden Markov models for speech recognition, of course we understand why hidden Markov models work. You know, it's a little bit of probability. But what they do, they just bloody feed the, the raw data into neural nets and somehow the thing figures it out. It's, um, you know, this might actually give us uh, a chance to produce truly intelligent systems because uh, we have absolutely no clue how this up here works, right? And neural nets only simulate uh, the, the geometric topology of the system just nodes with connections well but we don't know first of all if uh, there is processing inside of neurons to actually and in fact famous people like Penrose claim that uh, the essence of human reasoning is uh, through quantum mechanical processes uh, right which is kind of reasonable because many processes in nature, for example, photosynthesis is uh, a kind of quantum mechanical, explainable only on quantum mechanical uh, level. So maybe something like that happens uh, in our heads as well. Anyhow, so um, by stumbling in darkness, you produce a system that works better than anything else, and uh, I find this highly irritating. <laughs> Anyhow, so um, the recommended systems uh, that scored the best were never implemented. Guess why? That was way before neural nets. Why wouldn't you implement something that beats your system? It's slow. It's slow. It's, uh, uh, and uh, you couldn't tell among the top solution solutions which one was uglier. <laughs> they were all uh, basing recommendations uh, by weighted mean of uh, hundreds of individual algorithms, right? And uh, the weights, <laughs> the weights were just obtained by training and tweaking, right? Um, until they got uh, the best possible results. Now, how do you measure the performance of a recommender system? Well, you simply take an existing table of uh, uh, evaluations by users, uh, right? So, um, so you have a table. Say here are uh, users, and here are movies. Uh, and the table is, of course, only partly filled. Right? It's a very sparse table. The users, even kind of uh, users that like to watch movies, maybe they have a few hundred of uh, 
entries across uh, uh, probably hundreds of thousands of movies. And I hear there were a few monies who had several thousands of uh, recommendations. Uh, okay, so the point is now this, the recommender system simply when you test it, uh, it uh, blocks out, it removes essentially the a certain portion of the data. And then it, add, uh, it tests, it wants to find the predicted value of this user for one of these movies that he has actually ranked, uh, but you hid it from the system, right? And the RMS, root mean square, just square root of Euclidean distance, uh, is the measurement of the accuracy, right? So you understand how this works. And all of these systems, so Netflix provided a gigantic table uh, that was the training data. Uh, then pro uh, pro provided another table on which you test your system. And then a third table that was not revealed, of course, in which the system were actually tested for, for final, on which systems were competing, right? So if you have a gigantic table, you can yourself block out different subsets and uh, uh, train your system by trying to minimize the errors in, in blocked uh, cells. Now, as I mentioned, the winning systems were kind of concoction of a huge number of variances of various algorithms. But interestingly enough, there were only two fundamental ingredients. And one of them is kind of very easy to understand why it works. But the other one had a little bit, but tiny, tiny little bit flavor of this uh, miracle of neural nets because it produced uh, kind of data in a way that did not provide uh, an explanation, but it still worked well. Uh, something called the latent variable method. So what is uh, the, uh, uh, what is the what are the two principles behind these two methods? Uh, idea is this. Uh, take any two users, U1 and U2, and then restrict the domain of movies only to the movies that both U1 and U2 have uh, evaluated. Uh, this can then be used to tell how similar these two users are. If they tend to agree on this intersection part, how the, what, what scores they gave to movies, they would be similar, right? Uh, similarly, you can also take two movies, M1 and M2, and then look only at the users that have evaluated both M1 and M2, and you can then see whether they got similar evaluations or different evaluations. If the evaluations of all users tended to be close, right, these movies would be similar, and if the evaluations were different, this movie would be deemed to be different. So now you can do two things. You can, for example, you have now a user and you want to recommend for him a movie that he hasn't seen. You can, during pre-processing, you can uh, find uh, users that are similar to that user, right? And then look at the movies that the first you, that uh, um, you, uh, the person whom you want to recommend movie hasn't seen, right? 
but that were highly like ranked by users that are similar to him. Right? So you look for similar users and movies that they liked uh, to recommend to this. And so this is why it's called collaborative filtering, right? Because uh, you deduce the recommendation on the basis of interdependencies of evaluations of, uh, of users, right? Another approach would be to look for the movies that this user has seen and has highly ranked, and then look for similar movies to the ones that he has seen and recommend these. And this is essentially uh, the content except, right? Uh, the similarity has to be defined in a correct way in the sense that it's informative, right? So uh, we will see next time how this is done through least squares and uh, cosine similarity uh, measurement. So that's one approach, uh, namely to look at similarity between movies and similarity between users. But there is the second approach, which is called positive matrix decomposition. And uh, what time am I, I'm sorry, what time am I supposed to finish? Five minutes before the half hour, right? Okay, so we, I'll tell you, you have to live in a suspense. I'll tell you next time what the principle behind the second method is. Uh,